So we're going to get started, folks. Uh, my name is Oresti Varela. I'm with the Small Business Administration. I work out of the Springfield uh, office. We have two offices, one in Boston, one in Springfield. And uh, so welcome to the first uh, and probably not the last Western Massachusetts Women in Business Conference. We're very excited that uh, as uh, so much interest in this event and so many people participating. So thank you for taking the time out today to be with us and our myriad of uh, resource uh, partners and uh, sundry uh, folks that are uh, that are with us today. So, anyway, a few things before I introduce our first uh, speaker. Just some uh, the the interest uh, was uh, kind of overwhelming, and while I mean, one of the things we want to do is be able to answer everyone's questions. And probably we won't have time today to ask, answer everyone's questions during the conference. So what the plan of attack is that uh, put your questions in the chat box. The chat box will be uh, recorded and then we will answer the questions and send out a, uh, a frequently answer FAQs uh, to everyone after the meeting. So that's what the plan is in order to get all your questions answered. And you'll see there are emails and all kinds of ways to contact us. So if you do have specific questions, we will, uh, we will answer them. Uh, while, we're, uh, while I'm talking, if uh, folks who are already on board, if you can just in your in the chat box, just put the city and state where you are from. While this is a Western Mass conference, uh, kind of curious as to how far and wide, uh, where are people from? So, uh, and, and you know, it's always good to know how well your marketing is working and how expansive uh, that is. So thank you, I see, I see there are lots of people coming in all over the place, great, thank you, so yeah. Uh, the, yeah, so I covered those things. So I'm not going to cover the agenda that's been sent out and, uh, several different times. So, uh, but basically we're going to the, 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 the big overview is, uh, I'll be in, a, in just a second, I'm going to introduce our, uh, regional administrator, but then we, uh, go into a resource panel with our resource partners, then a small business owner panel, and then a contracting panel, and then, uh, and then a presentation by Diane Darling, who's with SBA, and, uh, and then some optional networking at the end. So that's the fast and furious agenda that we have today. And, uh, you know, in our team, we have a wonderful team. I'm not going to name everyone because I'll forget them all, but most of them, <laughs> we have a, a great big team. And we were talking the other day, uh, doing an event like this is like, uh, is like putting on a wedding. And then you spend all this time planning and planning, and then in a few hours, it's over. So anyway, but, uh, but it, and this is going to be just as joyous as a wedding. So it's a great, great event. We're so happy to be hosting it. And so with that, what I want to do is, oh, and just uh, from an administrative perspective, uh, Samalit Hogan from the Small Business Development Center, she's the regional director, she is actually the Zoom host. So she's, she's behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, back and left, everywhere. Uh, so taking care of all the technical things and run, literally running the show. So if there's some problem, you can send the message to her directly uh, and he'll, she'll hopefully be able to address it. So without further ado, let's get started with our first speaker. Uh, Wendell Davis is the Region 1 Administrator for the Small Business Administration. Region 1 includes all of the states of New England. So way up to Maine, down to Connecticut, and here in Mass and Vermont, New Hampshire, he covers it all. And he was appointed by the president. So pretty high level position there, Wendell. And uh, sir, the floor is yours. And I'm remembering to uh, unmute myself uh, to start out. And 
And Oreste, you made the mistake of giving me a shiny new object to chase, and I'm watching all of the towns come in, Williamsburg, Lynn, Worcester, Bellingham, South Hadley, North Grafton, Hampton Falls, New Hampshire. You've already taken me off my uh, game by, by having everybody input their towns. You, the reach is far for this seminar, which is great. And Oreste, thank you for that introduction. And, and obviously, thank you for everybody on the call. I know Sam Lee's on the call. I saw Lisa and Diane from the SBA on the call. And, and all of our resource partners and for pulling this together and you know your collective focus on helping women-owned businesses in western massachusetts is uh, exam exemplary and you know Rasti, not long ago just heck six months or so you know the form of this event would have been entirely different you know we would we, we would all be meeting in person and and the substance of the event also would have been different. You know, we would have been talking about all of the amazing work and strides that women-owned businesses had made and, and really the, the truly the most inclusive economy our nation had ever experienced. You know, if you recall at the time, you know, Black unemployment was at historic lows, Hispanic unemployment at historic lows, women unemployment was at historic lows. And, and women entrepreneurship was at historic highs. You know, American Express had done a study that I was – citing just six months ago uh, that found that women were, were opening up over 1,600 small businesses each and every day the entire year for 2018 and 2019. And what was really cool about that study was that minority women were driving that number in, and specifically African-American women repre represented over 40% of you know what I was calling at the time an economic renaissance that our, our country was uh, experiencing. You know, Arresti, now we find ourselves talking about things like business resiliency and, and pivoting and adapting and thriving. And, and in some cases, you know, we're talking about self-preservation and, you know, you know, my oh my, I mean, the times, you know, have changed, you know, but I, I truly feel that the policies are in place for recovery. You know, let me just highlight a couple of things about the SBA's PPP program. And the overall federal response to the pandemic, you know, first, over $500 billion over the last 12 to 16 weeks have hit the balance sheets of businesses across our country. That's an astounding number. And when you look at the overall federal response to the economic crisis caused by COVID, you know, while the impact of COVID has been unprecedented, you know, this administration's response has been equally unprecedented. And when you add up the PPP program and the, the increased unemployment benefits, you know, and making, and this is important, and this was critical, making UI benefits available to sole proprietors, you know, that made sure that the smallest of the small were helped. And when you overlay that with the stimulus checks and the programs like Main Street USA program through Treasury and the Defense Production Act, you know, this administration has presided access to an unprecedented level of capital and response. And, you know, sometimes I, I like, you know, perspective is important. So, you know, the last economic crisis that we faced as a country, that was 2008, 2009, the financial crisis. And if you recall, the main federal program at that time, you'll probably remember the acronym. It was TARP, T-A-R-P, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, you know, just the other day, I was listening to a morning business show, and they mentioned that it took over 13 months for the government to roll out that program, and that program represented roughly 6% of GDP. You know, the current response was done in weeks, not in years, and it was robust. Secretary Mnuchin just the other day mentioned that it represented 20% of the, of the overall GDP of our country. You know, in this quick and robust response, it, it helps stabilize our company, our, our country and our economy, and it helps save innumerable businesses across our nation. And, and we're seeing evidence of that V-shaped recovery uh, throughout our economy. You know, with that being said, you know, there's still work to do. And it's great to see the Massachusetts, Massachusetts office engaged in, in doing outreach events much like this. And, and highlighting the new programs and reminding folks of the existing programs. You know, for the SBA, you know, on our part, our, our overall part in this, you know, we still have $128 billion left in our, our PPP program that's awaiting further authorization from Congress. Uh, you know, until we get that authorization, and even if we don't get that authorization, you know, we've been focused in part, not just on the outreach, but also, you know, on the forgiveness of the PPP 
Um, and, and, you know, with the new forgiveness rules and flexibility, you know, we're expecting uh, that the lion's share of, of the PPP loans are going to be tantamount to a grant. And, and that's a good thing. And that's going to be a process that we'll, we're all collectively going to work through and get through over the next couple of months. You know, finally, Arresti, you know, I want to make sure folks are aware on this call that uh, of all the other federal programs that are out there, you know, at, at the regional level, my office has been engaged with Treasury, Commerce, uh, the Boston Federal Reserve, um, you know, the Development Finance Corporation, just a whole slew of other federal agencies uh, doing outreach to make sure that small businesses are aware of all the different programs that, that are out there. You know, just by way of example, the Main Street USA program, you know, that's a program that kind of fills in some gaps of the SBA program. It is a true gap funding uh, program. So if any businesses out there are, are, are realizing a liquidity event, uh, this is a short-term lending program. It's a five-year note versus the PPP loan, uh, which I'm sorry, versus our IDLE program, which is a long-term working capital program, a 30-year note. It's a five-year note. The first, two, the first year of principal and interest is waived. And that runs anywhere, that program is 250000 up to $500 million. So it's providing that gap funding for uh, so unique businesses that face unique challenges uh, due to the pandemic. You know, the other thing that I've been working with Connecticut and Massachusetts companies on uh, recently is the uh, Development Finance Corporation. They have a, a program that's under the Defense Production Act, and, and that program is, is helping fund uh, those businesses that are out there that are meeting the critical needs of our country right now, that COVID-19 related needs. Uh, and also there's a focus on reshoring uh, uh, materials and other uh, services, and it's, it's actually quite broad, that may have been impacted by COVID-19 that are critical to our nation's infrastructure and that, that should be and can be reshored in the United States. So that's a couple of examples of the programs out there. You know, our office has also been working with FEMA and its economic recovery team in, in working with some of the, the universities in the area to identify uh, critical areas like uh, uh, um, uh, child care. So we've identified child care as one of those critical industries that for us to fully recover, we have to make sure that our child care providers are up and running at full capacity. And I've worked with the state of Massachusetts and, and we've done some specific outreach along those lines. So those are some of the things we're doing, Arresti, and I want folks to, 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 to know that and understand that, that there are other programs out there. And if any, anybody has a question, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I'm assuming, Arresti, we can give out your email and your uh, cell phone. And, and if you get any questions, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to Arresti or Bob Nelson, the district director from Massachusetts, and, and I'll make sure that we respond to, the, to any questions that you may have in, a, in a, an expedited fashion. So I want to thank everybody for jumping on this call, and I want to thank you, Arreste, for giving me the opportunity uh, to welcome everybody, and I'm looking forward to the, the rest of the speakers and, and the content uh, today. Thank you again. Thanks, Wendell. Appreciate uh, you taking the time out today to, uh, to be with us. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, so, and yes, uh, Wendell mentioned about emails, the, even on uh, the, uh, the program, you'll see or that was up and that everyone will there it is you can see that the emails are there and uh throughout the program you will uh uh see there's many ways that you can contact us if you have questions so uh so what we want to do is roll into the first uh uh panel on our agenda which is the small business resource panel and uh, so the Small Business Resource Panel, so SBA consists uh, or, or has uh, four different resource partners, three of which will be uh, presenting today. I'm hearing some background noise somewhere. <laughs> anyway, I get distracted very easily. But anyway, so, uh, but, uh, so what we will do is roll right again roll, roll right into our first panel the panel consists of from the small business administration lisa gonzalez welch and she is one of our um uh one of our folks out of our uh boston office uh samalit hogan 
is the regional director for Western Massachusetts Small Business Development Center. We have uh, Sco uh, Heather Turner from SCORE. She's a SCORE mentor and will be speaking about our partners in SCORE. And from the Center uh, for Women in Enterprise, we have Dawn La Rochelle, who's a relatively new, and she's focused on COVID recovery programs for the Center for Women in Enterprise. So, so now I will turn over the mic to Lisa Gonzalez-Welch from the Small Business Administration. Lisa, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Oresti. And good afternoon, everyone. And I want to thank um, Oreste, my colleague, and Samalid, and CWE, and SCORE, and everyone who helped put this program together. I think it's wonderful. I see the numbers climbing. It's really exciting. So as Oreste stated, I am one of a team of uh, one from the Ma uh, Massachusetts Boston team office. Um, and for those of you who don't know SBA, let me just tell you a little bit about us. SBA, we are a federal agency and we've been around for a while. We were created by Congress back in 1963 with the mission to help start and grow businesses. So we do that a number of ways. And you're gonna be hearing about our resource partners. We provide counseling and training through our resource partners, which are SCORE, the Small Business Development Center, our Women's Business Center, which is the Center for Women in Enterprise, and the Veterans Business Outreach Center. Um, although everyone is now working remotely to keep everyone safe, we can certainly reach everyone and we can meet with you via Skype, Zoom, Teams, email, phone to help you in any aspect of starting and operating your business. In addition to providing technical assistance, we at the SBA can help you oftentimes access the capital that you need to launch and grow your business. Although we're not a lending institution, we partner with lending institutions throughout the state, banks and credit unions, where we can act as a guarantor when you can't get financing conventionally. So think of us as a co-signer, but it's up to the lender to make that determination. So by working with our resource partners, we can help you put your business plan in place, making sure that all your T's are crossed and I's are dotted before you meet with the lender. And if need be, they can look to have the SBA step in and guarantee a portion of the loan, getting them to that yes, to getting the financing that you need. In addition to that, we can help you grow your business. So how do we do that? Well, there's a number of ways. We can help you maybe if you're interested in maybe exporting your product or service. We have a small business development center dedicated specifically for exporting and we have an export um, uh, resource uh, person here at the SBA that can help you identify which country would be more likely to want to do business with you. So that's one way of growing your business if you have a product or service. In addition to that, perhaps you want to get into the contracting arena. There's a lot of opportunities and you'll be hearing a little later from my colleague Nadine Boone who heads up our contracting division in our office from Massachusetts and uh, the uh, Center for Women and Enterprise and the Procurement Technical Assistance Center representative on how you can grow your business by acquiring some contracts and subcontracts. There's a lot of opportunities out there. So how do you position yourself? What are the benefits of being certified as a woman-owned business and getting some of those set aside? So stay tuned because that's coming a little later in the program. In addition to that, we also wanna let you know that we have programs to help those of you who are in business who are being impacted by this pandemic. And Wendell Davis, our regional administrator, talked about uh, disaster assistance programs. So please, if you are being impacted, feel free to reach out to us. We'd be glad to connect you with resources that can be of help to you. Finally, I'd like to talk about our wonderful website. If you haven't visited our website, I encourage you to do so. You can find us at www.sba.gov forward slash MA. That's our Massachusetts site. I saw a lot of folks coming from a lot of places. So if you do come from another state, just put forward slash in your state at the end, and that will take you to a website that's dedicated specifically to SBA for your state. Within that website, you can get a listing of all the participating lenders that do SBA financing. You can actually get success stories. You can read about initiatives of programs and services that the SBA has that they're going to be launching to help those of you who are getting ready to start and grow your business. You can also um, get information on our resource partners and where to reach them. In addition to that, we have a great online classroom. 
So you can actually go to sba.gov forward slash training and take courses that range from seven to 20 minutes long on a variety of topics. And those are free of charge. And at the end, you get a nice diploma from the SBA that you can add to your business plan. And then I also want to encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. And you can do that at sba.gov forward slash updates. And you'll be on the pulse of what the SBA has in terms of programs, initiatives that can help you as you're getting ready to launch and grow your business. Just know that although we're not in our office, we're here to help you in every stage of starting and operating your business. Please feel free to reach out to any of us. We'd love to be part of your team and help you. And we love success stories. So keep us posted on your progress. And with that, I'd like for you to enjoy the rest of the program and I'll turn it back over to Oreste. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Great job covering uh, so much of what we do here. Uh, next on the panel is Samalit Hogan. Again, she is the director, regional director of the Small Business Development Center for Western Massachusetts. Samalit, you're on hi. camera. <laughs> yes, hi. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to today's uh, conference. Uh, happy to be here. So I serve as the regional director for the Small Business Development Center located in Springfield, Massachusetts. We, are, we cover the entire Piney Valley, Hampton, Hampshire, and Franklin County. The MSBDC network overall does cover all of Massachusetts in the sense that we have offices all throughout the state, about six of them. We also have under our umbrella the Mass Export Center, which helps businesses with government, um, with export and import and the Procurement Technical Assistance Center, which helps uh, businesses with government contracting. You will hear from Grace Oda later today on government contracting in that panel. So what do we offer, right? Well, what does the MSBDC actually do? I'd like to share with you that we, I'd like to break it up into three areas, pre-venture business services, startup business services, and established business services. So say you have a great concept, but you don't know where to start. Through a referral from one of our partners' organizations or just by going to our website and filling out a request for counseling form, we will meet with you confidentially, individually, and help you develop a plan and walk with you down that path of starting you know, a business. Now, say you're a startup business. Say you've already launched your business and this, the open sign is up, but you have found that things are not going like you expected. Maybe customers are not coming in or they're coming in too quickly and you need to realign or tweak your business strategies and you need professional assistance to help guide you. So we can provide you the guidance you need during those incredibly important, uh, important times when you first start in your business where you, where you run the greatest risk of failure. So we, we, we provide uh, a lot of assistance with business planning, cash flows, uh, business management, and we like to, we work with a lot of our partners to do educational programming that's ongoing. And I already put in the chat, um, the link to our YouTube channel, which we're posting all of our webinars. We have a marketing series, toolbox webinar series that is going on right now. And uh, some of the folks in this call are part of that collabor collaboration between technical assistance providers in our region. So we're very happy to put that together. The last segment that I mentioned was established businesses. So maybe you're ready to expand your business and take it to the next level, or maybe your business is growing, but you don't know how to manage the demands. Maybe you need some money to grow. So in that case, it's time to work on your business and not just in it. And through the statewide network of business professionals that I mentioned through the MSPDC, Mass uh, Exports and PTAC, we can provide the professional guidance that you need to make those critical strategic decisions necessary for long-term growth, profitability, and success. So we are the small, Massachusetts Small Business Development Center Network, www.msbdc.org. Thank you for coming today, and I hope you enjoyed the conference. Thank you, Samalid. Appreciate it. Uh, and uh, I just want to mention here before I introduce the next speaker that the major goal for today is to connect you with our resource partners so that you can have all your questions answered one-on-one. -on -one. The people who are presenting today, by and large, are uh, our resource partners, and they do one-on-one -on -one counseling that's entirely free and essentially unlimited. So if you needed to meet once a week or once a month or whatever it is throughout the life of your business or to start your business, 
any business questions, any business assistance, that's the major goal today is to connect you with our resource partners so we can help you start that business, grow the business, anything to do with your small business. So that's why we're here. Now, next on the agenda is Heather Turner from SCORE. Uh, again, one of our resource partners. Heather, the floor is yours with that beautiful uh, background. Look, you have a nice yard. <laughs> <laughs> it's fabric, actually. <laughs> Thank you, Rusty. So I am a SCORE mentor. Um, I am actually a dual chapter member. I am a mentor for Western Massachusetts SCORE and Merrimack Valley SCORE up here in New Hampshire. I started out in Connecticut and connected with Western Massachusetts SCORE, and I became a SCORE volunteer because about 17 years ago when I started my own business, I had a SCORE mentor help me. And it was time for me to give back, and it has been a lot of fun since then. To talk a little bit about SCORE is SCORE is the nation's largest network of volunteer expert business mentors, and we're dedicated to helping small businesses get off the ground, grow, and achieve their goals. No matter whether you're starting a business or you've been in business for many years and you just need help. We've been around since about 1964 and have provided education and mentorship to more than 11 million entrepreneurs. It's an awful lot of people that we've helped. We're a 501c3 nonprofit and a resource partner, as Lisa Welch mentioned, of the U.S. Small Business Administration. And thank you to the generous support from the SBA and because of the selfless contributions of more than 10,000 dedicated volunteers around the country, we're able to deliver most of the offerings at no cost. So we offer business mentoring, but most chapters also offer in-person when we don't have what's going on going on right now, uh, workshops. But right now, we're also doing a lot of workshops in, on Zoom itself. So our Western Massachusetts chapter, for example, is doing weekly workshops online, as is my Merrimack chapter. And they're in a whole variety of different topics. I did want to talk about mentoring, though, for just a moment more. And we are here to assist startups and, as I mentioned, also existing businesses. So we have a wealth of volunteer knowledge around the United States to take advantage of. So if you're looking for a mentor, it is free. Please take advantage of us. You can either go to score.org or you can go to a chapter. So Western Massachusetts SCORE is most of your local chapters, but there is also a Boston SCORE organization, or you can reach out to anyone. If you submit a request through SCORE, they try to match you up with someone that has the same business outlook that you're trying to do, whether if you're starting a business or again, you've been in business for a while. The fantastic thing about SCORE is if you have a business mentor and maybe they don't have a particular skill set that you're looking for, but they have most of the skills that you need to start or help your business, we have co-mentors that we can bring in from around the U.S. that specialize in things. So, for example, I specialize in the hospitality industry, so I do quite a bit of co-mentoring for businesses doing hospitality startups for restaurant and, and lodging professions, for example. One of my strengths is not accounting, but luckily we have SCORE mentors who specialize in accounting, so I am able to call on them to help any clients that I work with. We are free, and we are here from the single meeting if you just need a little bit of help or as long as you need. So please call on us. We are definitely here to help assist you and help you through your process of starting your business or going through your business. I would highly encourage people to go to score.org. Even if you're not looking for a mentor, there is a huge network and a huge resource library of both pre-recorded webinars and articles and blog posts and also ongoing national webinars that you can take advantage of for free. SCORE is also always looking for mentors, we're looking for subject matter experts, and we're looking for workshop presenters. Or if you just want to volunteer to help out, we are here to help, and we are also looking for help as well if you are looking for a worthwhile cause to volunteer for. I don't know much what, more what I can say about SCORE other than the fact that it is a truly wonderful organization. Um, it helped me greatly when I started up my business many, many years ago, and it has been an absolute joy working with people starting out businesses 
as well as working with people that have been in business for quite a while that need things like marketing help or financial assistance or just struggling, unfortunately, with COVID right now and need some assistance and some guidance. So we are here as a resource. Please reach out to us, and we are more than happy to help. Thank you, Reste. Thank you, Heather. Appreciate it. Uh, so now, last but not least, on our resource partner, the Center for Women in Enterprise, and Dawn La Rochelle will, uh, I don't know if she's French-Canadian, but I, I'm making it that way. But anyway, so uh, Dawn, uh, the floor is yours. Excellent. Um, I was actually going to go through a PowerPoint, but I think we're going to skip it in the interest of time, and I'll speak off the cuff, so if you want to cut that, that's okay. Um, so hi, thank everybody for coming today. Um, a little bit about the Center for Women in Enterprise. You've now heard from the MSBDC and SCORE. Um, like both the MSDC and SCORE, the Center for Women in Enterprise is an SBA resource partner. Um, what makes us a little bit different is that we focus on women owned businesses and also on businesses um, owned by members of underserved communities, uh, the Latinx, the BIPOC community, and we help them launch and successfully stay, sustain their businesses. Um, as everybody else was saying with their resource uh, partnership organizations, we work from you from the germ of an idea throughout the life cycle of your business um, at every point of development. Um, CWE, Center for Women in Enterprise, is a host organization as well for the Veterans Business Outreach Center of New England, otherwise known as VBOC, and also for the w Women's Business Enterprise National Council, also known as WEBEC, um, which provides certification for women-owned businesses, and that's something we're always delighted to speak with you about um, should you be at that point in your business life cycle. Um, CW, we have five women business centers. They are in Eastern Mass, Central Massachusetts, which also encompasses, as I always like to remind people, Western Massachusetts. Um, I hail originally from the uh, Berkshires of Western Mass and now live in Northampton of Western Mass, so I make sure none of us are forgotten. Um, we also have centers in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island. You've heard a lot about technical assistance um, and I always wonder if people think that means we work on your computers. No, technical assistance is um, a, a term that just means targeted development support, and that is what we offer you. So everything from one-on-one -on -one consultations to classes and programming, um, soup to nuts, we offer it. Where I fit in, um, as Arrest I had said earlier, I'm the new kid at the block. Uh, at CWE Central Mass, also includes Western Mass, and um, the SBA uh, generously provided us with a grant um, to provide uh, COVID business recovery um, to businesses that have been impacted by COVID, which at this point really, I think, includes pretty much every small business owner. Um, so I work with all small businesses in Central and Western Mass on any of your business recovery needs. That could be anything from how do I get funding? How do I get a grant? Um, how do I apply for PPP forgiveness? Um, how do I start a business? I wanna buy a business, I wanna sell a business. I'm thinking of closing my business. Um, again, you name it, we do it. We're here for you and for all your needs going forward. Um, I'm thrilled to see you all at this conference and um, hope that I will hear from you all afterwards uh, should you need the assist. And I think that's about all I've got to say. I'll uh, leave it back to a rest day at this point. Thank you, Don. Appreciate it. And now uh, uh, the next few minutes, we're going to take uh, questions for this uh, panel, uh, again, relative to the panel. I see <laughs> Samalit is launching, has already launched uh, one Sorry. of the several polls. It's okay. I took it back. <laughs> huh? Sorry, I took it back. I, when you said questions, I was like, that's my cue. <laughs> <laughs> so questions does anybody... for the panel, for all of us. So let's ask the other panelists to put up their cameras. So does anybody have a question? Uh, I know there were a couple of questions that came up. 
about connecting with uh, the folks here today. A program, I sent an email out to everyone this morning, hopefully you received it, with the program, which actually has all the contact emails on it. Uh, so hopefully uh, folks received it. I see Dawn just put hers uh, out there. And uh, anyway, anybody have any pressing questions? Otherwise, we'll launch into the poll. And Oreste, I'm also uploading the conference uh, agenda uh -huh. in the chat. So now people see, can download Samal, it. See, Samalit has so many talents. So she's, uh, she's loading that uh, link to the program. So you will have all the contact. Thank you. So Jill Samalit. has a question. That's a, always a good question. Oh, somebody asked, how do you know if I should use a score mentor or CWE or SBDC? You could use any of them. You could use all of them. So the, you know, people are people, everyone uh, connects uh, differently uh, or, or, you know, has some chemistry. So look at the, go to the organizational websites uh, uh, that again are on the program and take a look and see if that appeals to you. And then, uh, or m more importantly, the folks here today uh, that, you know, let's say, oh, you like what Dawn had to say and you wanna connect with her, so connect with Dawn. So, uh, but again, you can use any of our resource partners or all of them, uh, there's, there's no limit. Good question. I'd like to, I'd like to add to that, um, Oreste, real quick. Um, I, I, in something that Heather mentioned, which is so important too, is that once you reach out to a resource partner, doesn't mean you are stuck with them or obligated just to stay with them. Everyone has their talents, mm -hmm. everyone has their area of expertise, different backgrounds. So in our office, we have um, three full times, well, three and a half uh, advisors, one is part-time. And um, we, we're Monday through Friday, and we'll have all our backgrounds, you know, but you could reach out to SCORE, for example, and uh, find someone that's been in that industry, you know, that has already start, has had a business in that area that could kind of connect you or guide you and mentor you in that specific area. But if you're looking for more general advice and you're looking to apply for a loan for funding for the SBA or a bank or whatever, you can go to, to um, the, a generalist <coughs> advisor like the MSBDC and get that help. And for the CWE, I'll let Dawn explain like what their, what their area of expertise, she already mentioned that, but would you reiterate again what your area of expertise is, Dawn? Sure. So the Center for Women in Enterprise in general, as I discussed, well, we do not discriminate against anybody. Um, we specialize in women-owned small businesses as well as um, small businesses that are owned by members of underserved communities, so Latinx and BIPOC. Um, and again, my role is specifically COVID-focused, so I work with small business owners who have questions um, or, or concerns dealing with COVID. And it could be, you know, I'm drowning, I wanna sell my business, I need to figure out some kind of exit plan. It could be, I wanna start a business. I know Samalit had mentioned um, at the beginning of this um, conference that there are many people who are now looking to start a business during COVID. And it is possible and we can help you should the need arise. Um, so that's where we fit. And I also, I guess, wanted to add, um, just to piggyback on what Somali and Heather and everyone else were saying, um, the SBA resource partners are not in competition with each other. We all work uh, in collaboration with each other and in concert with each other. I hope that you're getting that feeling just from seeing this presentation. So once again, don't feel that you have to pick and choose. Um, meet with all of us, see where you feel comfortable, see who can help you in different areas, um, and then go from there. Thanks, Don. And I, I saw a couple of questions. Uh, uh, Anna asked, uh, does SBA assist women opening a real estate business? If you mean uh, becoming a real estate broker, yes, our resource partners can help uh, in that regard. Uh, the, the, where we kind of draw the line is real estate investment. That's not necessarily considered a business. So, but anyway, if you're looking to become a broker, which is a, considered a business, then yes, our resource partners can help. Uh, Lisa Ducharme, our good friend, 
uh, uh, talks about veterans military and one of the resource partners that's not here today, which is actually a kind of a sub organization under the Center for Women and Enterprise is the Veterans Business Outreach Center. So we have a resource partner that just works with veterans and their uh, families. So thanks, Lisa, for uh, chiming in on that. Uh, and then uh, there's probably more questions than I'll be able to answer within the time frame, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. The, uh, 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 Denise asked about how is SBA paying for their loan. I'm not exactly sure what that means, uh, and, unless uh, we're talking about uh, uh, SBA was paying for existing SBA loans for six months, uh, interest and principal, uh, through the end of September, I believe it was, or loans that were closed before the end of September. Uh, but that would be something to email me directly and we can track that down for you, uh, 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 Denise. Uh, let's see here. There's a specific question that I can't really answer here by Melissa about a previous business uh, and a, a changing uh, let's see, the MBE due to divorce, business name change. That's a real specific question. Uh, but anyway, again, contact one of us, maybe, you know, uh, you know, contact one of our resource partners and, uh, give them a shout and, uh, and we'll work you, we'll work you through that. So let's see here. Okay. Uh, Right, Maxine, yes, existing loans. Uh, uh, so to further that uh, answer is that uh, Maxine and Jeffrey, uh, that's supposed to happen automatically. You should contact, now that I understand what it is, you should contact your lender first. Contact your lender saying, hey, <laughs> this is supposed to happen automatically. Uh, SBA is uh, paying uh, our, our loans. <laughs> is this happening? <laughs> so anyway, uh, so there's that. Uh, I'm trying to read fast and talk fast. Uh, Rosemary uh, needs assistance. And again, uh, contact one of us and we'll try to uh, help you out as best we can. Uh, uh, anyway. All right. So what we I have think two more minutes if if you want to if there's any other questions you want to address any more questions before I noticed actually there was someone when I asked earlier for people to put um, where they were from somebody's from San Diego California woohoo we're all the way on the west coast so hey that's some good marketing we got going just asked I'm looking for a business coach to help with rebranding my business uh, Jamie, uh, what we'd like to do is set you up with a resource partner who's, uh, even though it doesn't matter, we're in a virtual world now, who's uh, physically close to you. So if you could let us know uh, where you were located, and then we can connect you with, uh, with a business coach. Uh, one of the folks today, Diane Darling, is really great, uh, who works for SBA out of her Boston office. She's really great. And she's going to be talking about marketing, branding uh, later today. So, uh, so she would be really good. And uh, government contracting, we have a whole segment on government contracting. So, and Jamie, so at her Northampton. So if you contact uh, Samalid, actually, I think that would be best. So Samalid, I see I'm out of time. Now let's launch into our first polls. <laughs> I'm sharing the results of today's poll so everybody can see who is in the room. Very interesting. 40% uh, five to 10 years and almost 40% less than a year and then a smattering in between. So that's pretty interesting and in how long people have been in business. So we have existing, uh, majority is existing businesses and then we have a lot of uh, kind of startups out there and then uh, you could see there most people offer a service. Very interesting also. Uh, woman owned, 94%. That's no surprise. <laughs> so, and it's good to see we have a few people who are not women owned. So everyone is, is more than welcome to participate and can learn. So that's really wonderful. And how did you hear about us? Uh, knowing about marketing is always really important when you put on an event or you're selling a product. And uh, we can see that the majority of people, 59% uh, 
received uh, email from SBA, so that's great. And then uh, email from our resource partners, uh, so that's uh, really good information. So uh, great. So that's our first poll, and it's just interesting information for you to keep in mind. So next on the hip parade is we have our women in business panel discussion. And that is going to be moderated by Michelle Miller, who's also with the Small Business Development Center. So, Michelle, the floor is yours. If you can take it away with our three uh, uh, business owners, that would be wonderful. Absolutely. Thanks, Sareste. Katisha, Madeline, and Colleen, I sent you all an invite to turn on your cameras, or Samalad may have done that as well. Pleasure yeah. to meet you all. I am Michelle Miller with the Center for Women in Enterprise. I am very glad to partner with the MSBDC, but we are different organizations. Um, and CWE, as was already announced, we focus on women-run firms. Not going to turn anybody away, but we approach everything from a feminist business model perspective and are here to support you with that. So I am quick scrolling through. I see Madeline. Hi, Madeline. And Hello. I see can you hear me? Hello. Yes, we can hear you, Madeline. And Katisha, I can see you too. Hello. Um, and Colleen, there you are. can hear you too. Excellent. Or see you anyway. Welcome, everyone. So as we've been doing so far, we're kind of going on this principle of one diva, one mic. So if you could keep yourself on mute when you are not speaking, that would be excellent. That said, I'd love to have start with an introduction, Katisha, Madeline, and Colleen, in that order. I'll ask you if you could just say a few words about yourself, your business, any major points that you'd like to cover. If you could limit it to a couple minutes, that'd be ideal, and then we'll use the remaining time uh, for some Q&A. Katisha, do you mind kicking us off? Cool. Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really overjoyed uh, to be part of this inaugural, this first ever, ever Western Mass uh, Women in Business uh, virtual conference. And I, of course, offer a great, a hu big, huge thank you to all the organizers, presenters, and my fellow panelists, as well as all the women in business um, that have chosen to register and participate with us today. Um, and I know, and I hope, and I believe that when you look back um, at this experience today, you'll see this as one of the highlights in your business journey. Um, I'm Katisha Galishaw, founder and CEO of KG Virtual CFO. We provide cloud-based um, bookkeeping and financial management services to small businesses, entrepreneurs, and even nonprofits and religious organizations. We see it as our mandate to help small businesses and organizations responsibly maximize their growth potential. And I never saw myself as an entrepreneur. Um, I was blessed with a great and stable government job right out um, of undergrad. Started with the Internal Revenue Service almost uh, 20 years ago. Um, please don't start doing the math on that. But um, over those past some odd years, I've worked with uh, for-profit and nonprofit businesses in various sizes of various complexities, situated in various industries, but I've always had the heart uh, to help small business owners. So I think where my story may intersect with some of those, particularly those in the early stages um, on this online meeting today is that I started KG Virtual CFO during a time of personal crisis and financial uncertainty. Um, I was still, and, and I am still working with the Internal Revenue Service, but back in December uh, 2018, the government shut down, the US government shut down and the majority of federal employees were furloughed. So no work and no pay. Um, so for what turned into a very long um, 35 days for someone that has been working since they, uh, I've been a teenager. Um, so uh, I decided to use that accounting expertise and the passion for small businesses. I wanted to help small businesses, but I quite frankly lacked the entrepreneurial knowledge and skill and quite frankly, I, I lacked the, the courage to start a business. So I, I was terrified, but I started afraid. Um, and I reached out to the resources here, reached out to Areste with, he started like a, a starting business, a workshop down at Springfield Library a few years um, back in 2018. And um, I had I participated um, in a, a, in a, 
business planning workshop. That was back a few years ago when uh, CWA brought it. They hosted it, but it was in the MSBDC in Springfield. So I've gleaned and I've um, tapped into MSBDC advisors. I've tapped into all those resources that have been on display today and um, some that we'll be talking about a little bit later on. I tapped into those and I took um, whatever knowledge I could, gleaned as much knowledge, gained that network and support, and started a business um, within those 35 days of furlough. So um, really excited to be here today and share a little bit of my story. Thank you so much, Katisha. Appreciate it. Madeline, I'll switch it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, my name is Madeleine. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Amity. Uh, my husband and I just started Amity back in 2013. Also, at a time of uncertainty, um, we recently moved, had moved from Maryland, and we started an exterior cleaning business. Um, I didn't have any background in business as Katisha, but I realized that I needed help. The first thing I did was reaching out to the Center for Women and Enterprise, and I met Michelle. She, you were a huge, huge help. Um, I didn't know what to do at the time. We were based in our house. Um, we found after two years, great opportunities in construction. So we started doing exterior remodeling, doing roofing, siding, windows for residential customers. Um, at some point, I went to, to your office, uh, Michelle's office, at the Center for Women and Enterprise, and we had this discussion about the name. The name of the business was Hector Power Clinic, but we were doing construction work. So it was like a misalignment here with the name. I basically showed 100 names, and we picked Amity. The name of the business is Emily plus Matthew, my two little kids. Um, so that's how we came up with this name, MT. Also, MT.com was available. So that was great. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it has been great. Uh, we received a lot of support, especially this year. We had a lot of goals um, for this year, especially if we wanted to form our first sales team. We started our looking for candidates. I made a couple of interviews. Everything was ready in March. We hired our perfect sales team. And after two days, they had it started. We had to close the business. It was so sad. I was like, oh my gosh, this can't be possible. Why I didn't do it before? Why I had to wait until today? Um, but then we received support from SBA. We applied to PPP, to the disaster loan, and we are here stronger than ever. Um, we had to go back home and, you know, take a couple of days off. But it was great because it kind of, it was a time to reflect and to think who we are as a company, who we want to become. Um, I have an engineering background. I have my bachelor, master's, and PhD in engineering. Um, when I was at Howard University um, doing my master's degree, I started research in solar energy. So it was my dream to have this solar energy company. And finally, I had the time to dedicate uh, to, to make it happen. So basically I took this time, the COVID time, to add this new service uh, to the business. So now we are doing roofing, siding, and solar. Um, and well, all I have to do to say today is thank you to the SBA for all the resources, to the Center for Women and Enterprise for all the support. Thank you so much, Madeline. My goodness, I'm getting goosebumps listening to these amazing women, aren't you all? This is phenomenal. All right, thank you so much, Madeline. Colleen, I'll turn the mic to you. Great, thanks so much. Um, so I'm Colleen Del Vecchio, and I am the kind of owner, um, chief consultant at Colleen Del Vecchio Consulting. So for me, um, I started my business really part-time kind of as a side gig back in 2004. And then in 
August of 2019, my position, my full-time position that I had had got eliminated and decided instead of looking for another job, I was going to go out on my own and try it um, full-time. So, <laughs> you know, I started full-time into this about a year ago and my business kind of has three components of where I'm doing coaching, training, and consulting. So the coaching I do is career and leadership coaching, um, the majority of which is for women. Um, I probably say 95% of my clients are women. Um, um, I do a lot of career coaching on kind of helping women figure out what type of career is going to make sense for them and that fits into their life as they kind of move forward. Uh, the leadership coaching I do is all strengths-based, uh, Gallup StrengthsFinder based, and really kind of work with mostly C-suite level women on how do they build really cool leadership teams and how do they move up to the C-suite in a really good way. Um, the next part of my company had been kind of consulting. I have been going into different organizations, a lot of nonprofits, and doing a lot of consulting around nonprofit boards. Um, and boards of directors and organizational change. And then the last part is training. And right before COVID hit, um, I was scheduled to do four keynotes um, over the course of the spring and also speak at South by Southwest, all of which got canceled, uh, right? And all of the in-person training that I was supposed to do. So I got really worried and um, had been talking to the person who um, helped me out at SCORE about marketing before that and really kind of jumped in a little bit, started thinking about some of my connections and doing a little bit more marketing from some of the work she and I had done together. And all of a sudden I found myself actually over busy. So at this point, um, I am finding myself having lots of training contracts, um, everything from Fortune 500 companies to really small local businesses who are just using this time to train their employees since their employees aren't working as full-time. So it's been really exciting. Um, just like Katisha and Madeline, right? I was a little bit terrified, or you didn't say terrified, but I was a little bit terrified about doing this on my own. And years ago, I um, was a job coach for people with disabilities, way, way back in the 90s. And I remember working with a person with a disability and helping them go to SCORE to get some help to help them figure out how to start a sandwich delivery business. And so when I started kind of off of my own, one of the first things I thought of was kind of how much help SCORE had been to that person, you know, 25 years ago. And so it was one of the first calls that I made was to score, to try to kind of get some of those research resources. Thanks so much, Colleen. All right, everybody, I am keeping an eye on the chat box. We've got a few minutes for questions here. So please throw in any questions that you have for these phenomenal women in the chat. And I'll kick us off with a couple. One that I'd like to start with is what you wish you would have known prior to launching. And I'll open it up for all three of you, so just pop in. Um, well, as I said, my, my background is in the engineering. When, we, when, I started the, when my husband and I started the business, I didn't know the meaning of profit, revenue, profit margin. So it was me in front of the numbers. I didn't know what they meant. Um, so I had to basically teach myself all this information, and I didn't have time to process but to apply the knowledge right so it could have been so beneficial to take a business class before <laughs> and not learn this in the, the hard way <laughs> i feel you there <laughs> katisha and colleen what do you think i'd say i wish i'd done it sooner right i really wish that i hadn't waited years and years to do it because of my fear of kind of just being an independent person and uh, not an independent person, but just being a one person business. Uh, I really love kind of networking and being with people. And I was worried that being a solopreneur would not allow that. And what I found is, right, I'm talking to great people every single day. I can certainly echo that. Um, just wishing that I stepped out a little bit sooner and seeing how, um, 
my taking the step forward has inspired others to join along and get connected to resources that many of us, quite frankly, didn't know existed. Even though I've been born and raised in Springfield, Mass., I didn't know the wealth of resources that were available for free in this area. So as I took that step forward, I Start, started to see more of those resources that were uh, available. And I think another point that I wish I would have known is how much that your technical expertise is important, but what's even more important is that kind of higher level, how much you have to oftentimes transcend from that technician um, phase of working to more so building that C-suite and building that team uh, to allow your business to grow. Um, even more. I love it. Thank you. And uh, I completely hear you on the bit about business classes and financials. I had a coffee shop in another life before I started working here and I was right in that same boat. <laughs> kinda, um, so I'm with you there. I'd love to hear about what you wish, I mean, follow the chat box. I don't know if you ladies are able to do that while you're chatting, but there are a lot of women who are in different stages of business. And the most recent chats that I'm seeing have a lot about, ah, you know, I feel like maybe I can start now. And it, it sounds like we've got a lot of pre-launch folks that are, that are listening to this section. So what I'd love to hear from you ladies is what you would like those aspiring women to know. Just do it. And don't be afraid to ask for help. I mean, even if you want to reach out uh, to me to bounce things off of, but just take that step, um, the first step forward, and you'll be surprised at um, how how many opportunities would open up to you and um, how many resources will avail themselves to you and how much you'll learn and how much you'll enjoy it. Um, you'll enjoy it so much oftentimes that it, it kind of over. Uh, compensates for the fear that you may be feeling. Um, but yeah, my, my advice is just to do it. I echo what Katisha said and would also add, right, put together a group of people who you can um, kind of lean on and talk to and run things by, right? Kind of your own personal board of directors. Get a group of four or five, you know, folks that are the people that you have a regular call with once a month to just kind of run things by and bounce things also off of. Um, so. Yeah, I completely agree with, with Katisha and Colleen. So we as women, we have the tendency to have all the information and all knowledge before starting something. In my case, in my mind, I, I was like, okay, I need my bachelor's. Not enough, it's not enough. I need my master's, it's not enough. I need my PhD and then a postdoc. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, when I'm going to start? Like it's time. And, and, and at this point, it's like, there are so many pieces missing, but as we start and we start doing, we start connecting those pieces. So like Katisha said, just do it, start. And, and you will find the answers in a way. And following Colleen, uh, SCORE is a great resource. The one of the first things I did was going, uh, there is a website where you can filter by the need. For example, you need assistance in sales. I found a great mentor, uh, Betsy Harper. She is a 30 year veteran in sales. So I meet with her every two weeks and we have mentorship in, in, in sales. Um, yes, and find mentors. Find mentors and you are not alone. People are willing to help, believe it or not. And, and there are so many people that can, can assist you. Thank you so much, all of you. A couple of questions in the chat. One from Samalid, what was the biggest challenge you had to overcome when you were starting and growing your business? I'll pick on someone. Colleen, can we start with you? I don't think we picked on you first yet. Sure. I was trying to think. I mean, really, it was myself, um, right? It was for years, I would have people say to me, you should just do this on your own. Like, why don't you just start your own business and do this? And I kept saying, gosh, right? No, I really like the nine to five Monday through Friday. I like the structure. I like the people. Like, I kind of kept coming up with all excuses to get in my way. And if I had known how much I was going to absolutely love this, I would have done it, you know, 
15 years ago when I first started doing it kind of part time. So. Um. Yeah, as a left brain person, the marketing aspect has always been and continues to be um, a challenge for me. But I did meet with Samalit in the early stages and she gave me some guidance on how to start and I tried to start it on my own but and I took um there's like this on there's, uh, online there's like now um a marketing series where you know it guides you through the process and as much as I've tried to wrap my head around it I don't have that brain but I know what I need in order to hire someone so um I've gained all the the marketing knowledge that I feel that I need in order to kind of outsource that but marketing just has been my by far um, biggest challenge but um, you can overcome that by connecting with people that um, are strong where you are weak and um, definitely getting the base knowledge that you need in order to guide them in your brand and what's important to your company so that's been my biggest challenge so far. Uh, my challenge has been financing. Um, I am good with numbers, but other type of numbers, like software numbers, I don't know, programming. Um, uh, one of my mentors, she says, Madeleine, just look at your profit and loss statement. And I'm like, I can't. I mean, I have the paper in front of me. It's like, I don't know what it means. Um, so that's why I, I recognize since, the, my, since we started the business, that we needed a huge help with financing and reading the numbers, profits, revenue, all these numbers. So basically um, having this right and proper information to make decisions. Yeah. 100%. It's another one. How do you keep yourself on track and motivated during the tough times, especially when we think about balancing family and business responsibilities? I'll say from the balancing piece, um, I have two teenage daughters, um, so it's a little easier in that sense. They're not young, but, you know, for me, it's all about calendaring. You know, people definitely will laugh when they're on a call with me and I pull up the calendar if I'm sharing it because I have like my calendar layered with my daughter's calendar, layered with like my ex-husband's calendar. So we can kind of figure everything out and it's like everything is just in there. Um, and some of what I found was, you know, being a solo entrepreneur, it means that there are nights that I'm working and, you know, there are, especially doing training and coaching, people work full time, they need me to do those trainings and the coaching in the evening. And, you know, we just, I just kind of make sure that I schedule those times to be around for the family as well. Um, yeah, um, I'm going to lean a little bit on my theological training and talk about Sabbath. So it's been really important for me to schedule. If it's not a whole day, it's probably never really a whole day, but a portion of a day or even those breaks during the day where I can refresh and replenish myself, like shut everything, like everything off. And um, like, especially working with small business owners, trying to know, navigate the PPP loans and the SBA funding and all of that. And I hear heartbreaking stories all day long and I'm dealing with the numbers and I'm trying to talk them through that. It can be overwhelming and just watching the news and just checking your news feed. It is constantly overwhelming. So I have to carve out intentionally a portion of my day or week just to refresh. And I find from that space, then I can um, schedule out the regular, the rest of the time and the rest of the responsibilities that has been um, vitally crucial for me keeping my sanity during these times. Um, well, I have two little ones. Emily is seven, Matthew is nine. When we started the business, um, Emily was in my belly. So we've been dealing with overwhelming and we have to deal with so many things at the same time. I was doing my PhD while I was a software engineer at Dell, um, also with the family. But in general, having a great partner, my husband, who is there to help, who is fully supportive, has been great. Um, in our case, I always say, 
there is, we are going to fail, right? We are going to fail, but we are going to fail fast, stand up, and continue. Um, yeah, I mean, I love research and development, so my goal at some point is to, to develop a solar panel uh, here in Massachusetts. So basically, that's my long-term goal, and slowly, slowly, we are getting there. <laughs> I know there is years until we accomplish the goal, but we are in the, on our way there. So that's kind of my motivation. <laughs> I love it. Thank you all. We've got, I believe, about seven minutes left with these phenomenal women. I've got a question that I, I believe, Woodlene is how you say it. Forgive me if I'm saying your name wrong, but maybe you could put some clarification in the chat. You say, how do you guys balance with your families and friends who might not believe what you have going on and wants you to go back to nine to five? And so I wonder if you mean, um, may not understand the full pressure of the business or, or what that is um, okay, and that's a yes. So may not understand or believe the full impact of the business. How do you all handle that? I'll say that I feel like I explain what I do to my mother on a probably every other week basis, um, right? And she's constantly saying, now what is it you do again these days, uh, right? And wh why aren't you gonna go back to a nine, you know, a full-time job, um, you know? And so for me, I have talked about how this has been better for my family. Um, you know, it, COVID kind of has changed it all, right? We're all home together. Uh, my husband is a small business owner. He has a company with a staff of about 30. And so, right, we're all home all the time. And as we kind of figure this out together, um, I'll say to my mom, right, it, even if she doesn't get what I do or why I'm doing it, this is a better choice for right now for us, um, you know, and more than just from a business standpoint, but just for our whole life standpoint, um, which to me is actually the whole point of the career coaching that I do, right? I really work with folks to figure out how do you find a career that works for your entire life at this moment in time? And for me, that's what this is right now. This is what's working best for me right now. Um, well, I had this full-time job at Dell as a software developer for eight years. And always, every single day, I was thinking about the business, thinking about the business. Um, and at some point, I lived very close to my job site, to the, the, my previous job. I, I used to say, I really, I am going to miss, when I quit my job, I am going to miss my job. And it hasn't been like that. Like I pass that place every single day and I just don't miss the office and the nine to five. I love the flexibility. I love um, that I can pick up the kids. Um, it is a little bit unstable. There are other things because if we don't produce, there are other things, right? So we don't eat basically. So the business, needs, the business needs to produce in order to, for, for me to continue in the business, it has to work, right? So yeah, I, I don't miss be, being in the office. Well, I'm kind of cheating because I'm still in the office a bit. Um, so the, the, um, been extremely blessed to allow the business to grow. Um, and I've hired um, employees to help with the day-to-day -day operations while I still maintain um, my, my work with the, with the government. Um, so I'm cheating a little bit, um, but I, I know I'm planning the business um, to grow to a point where I don't know, well, I have to make that decision where it has to be completely full-time. I cannot um, um, hire myself out of what I do. Um, but I think when, I've, when I first w was explaining it to uh, my family and as they have seen the business grow and develop, they see how much it aligns with uh, my personal values and who I am. And so they, and they, they're able to see how much it brings me joy to serve uh, small business owners and see how much it is in line with what I've already done and what I've already been doing. So for me, it hasn't been that much of a, a stretch or a hard sell because it's who I am. It's, it's what I, it's what I've always done and, 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 um, and what I hope to continue to do. So 
Thanks so much, all of you. We're about at the end of our time, and we want to get you all a break before we come back for the next segment on certifications. Uh, thank you all so much. Samalit, I'll turn it back to you. Yes, thank you to all the panelists. That was wonderful. Very, very motivational. I love learning about all of you. Thank you so much for being here today. And now we have our next uh, panel. Go ahead, Nadine, take it away. <laughs> Somali, good afternoon to you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining our women's conference this afternoon. I'm Nadine Boone with your Massachusetts Small Business Administration. I am the lead business development specialist as well as the lead economic development specialist here in Massachusetts. And we are located at 10 Causeway. But since everything is virtual, you can also find us at sba.gov forward slash MA for Massachusetts. And please subscribe to our website where you will find lots of useful information for all small business owners. Today, I am going to be joined while we talk about Women Business Owners Certification and Contract in Pana. I'm going to be joined by Don LaRochelle with CWE, as well as Grace Otto with the Massachusetts PTAC. And that the Massachusetts PTAC is a part of the Massachusetts Small Business Development Center. So I want to talk to you a little bit about federal government contracting. And I would like for all of you small business owners to consider why would you want the federal government as your customer? Uh, I want you to know that the federal government is the world's largest buyer of goods and service, that the federal government purchases close to or over $500 billion worth of goods and services each year, and that federal agencies are required to work with small businesses. They have goals to work with small businesses, and we will talk about those a little bit. Um, we have our woman-owned small business, which has a 5% threshold. We have our small disadvantaged business forward slash 8A business development with a 5% goal or target. We have our service disabled, service disabled veteran owned small business with a target of 3%. And we also have our hub zone, HUB for historically underutilized business zone for a 3% target. So I think I've just learned that um, it's gonna be Michelle Miller, not Dunn, who is going to be joining me along with Grace this afternoon. But the federal government has pledged to work with 23% of small businesses. Now, 23% of $500 billion is a lot of money out there for small business owners. And so you heard me talk about these buckets of woman-owned, small disadvantaged business, 8A, service disabled, hub zone, and everybody else that fits in who would be a small business owner if you do not fit in some of those other buckets. Now, how does the federal government help you to become a contractor here at the Small Business Administration? We provide informational seminars just like this one that we are having right now to help you to learn how to get your fair share of federal government contracts. We have classes, workshops, and, and other resources that are uh, resource partners out there to help you. Uh, what your part is, can you spend the time required to learn the rules and the regulations for to identify agencies who buy what you are selling? And that's going to be the biggest dilemma, whether it is federal government contracting, state government contracting, or the city in which you live trying to find out who buys what you are selling. That is what you're going to need to ascertain. Are you financially ready to do business to support the costs involved in working with the government? 
And are you able and willing to learn the regulations that's going to be associated with working with the government? There's going to be registrations and databases that you're going to need to complete. For federal government, it's gonna be called SAM, System for Awards Management. And you would need to make certain that you're in SAM.gov, G-O-V. Um, and make sure that you are not. Everything that I'm talking to you about right now is free. It's so important that I say that to you because if you find yourself in a website when you are registering to do business with the government and someone starts to talking with you about paying $100, $500, whatever the case may be, you need to back out of there quickly. Please do not do it. Working with the government is free to as far as setting up databases and applying to do business with the government. Surely you're going to have to have capability, capacity, and cash flow access to capital to do business with the government. SAM, System for Awards Management, is a database that all federal contractors use to see if you are indeed co correctly registered to do business with the government. Also in SAM, there is a supplemental page called the Dynamic Small Business Search, which you would also need to complete because if you are looking at the SBA certifications of HubZone or 8A Business Development, they will show up only in the dynamic small business search and may or may not show up in SAM, but you would need to do that. And that is one of the first things for getting started. As I talked about these certifications, there were self certifications, and then there are high, highly regulated and highly visible SBA certifications, 8A business development, as well as HubZone is an SBA certification. Um, they are, as I said, highly visible and highly regulated. So there are site visits or annual reviews that go along with those. The woman-owned small business has previously been a self-certification, but we are in the process of that changing right now and as of October 15, 2020, the woman-owned small business is no longer a self-certification. You do need to certify via a third party like the Women Business Center and Michelle Miller will talk with you a little bit more about that or there's going to be a free online and the service disabled veteran owned certification. At this time, it is a self-certification. So here, thank you, Somali. Thank you so very much. Here is the federal government wide procurement scorecard. And you heard me talking about these certifications. Thank you so much, Somali. And so you heard me talk about the 23% and the 5% for women and the 5% for small disadvantaged versus 8A, service disabled, veteran owned small business, as well as the uh, hub zone. And so Somali on my screen, because I cannot see the full right side over there so that we can see in 2019 what the actual goal was. So federal government, as you can see, they got an A, because with the exception of HubZone, all of its goals were achieved in excess. And we're still working to bring that HubZone up. And this is something that we can provide to you. I also want you to know that subcontracting is a great way for you to enter government contracting also to get your feet wet and to find out if it's really something for you we frequently ask that question, is government contracting for me? Okay, I think that I am now gonna turn this over to Michelle. Hi everybody, thanks so much Nadine. Michelle, back with you again. Uh, the Center for Women and Enterprise, as Nadine started to mention, among our programs we offer a third party certification service, which is called WeBank. Acronym's a little confusing because it sounds a lot like something to do with banking or getting money, 
Nope, that is just how the acronym sounds. Um, but it stands for the Women's Business Enterprise National Council. So if I may, I'll back up a little bit for folks on this call who may be new to the world of certifications, which is just to say that you can kind of think about certifications as falling into a few buckets. You can think about the private sector and you can think about the public sector. And that public sector breaks down into federal level, state level, and municipality level. And there are a few other diversions from there that, that you may sometimes run into, but those are the primary buckets. So a lot of what Nadine is talking about has to do with the public sector contracts and getting certified as woman owned through the SBA and other partners can be a really great way of taking advantage of those contracts. Where the WeBank arm that CWE runs comes into play is we play in the private sector in the in the for folks who are either corporations that are looking to commit to doing a certain amount of business uh, with women run firms or women run firms that wanna become part of that pool. So on the public sector side, as Nadine said, with those really amazing statistics, there are set asides, federally mandated goals uh, for businesses that are run by women or veterans or people of color. On the private sector side, that's not so much the case. What is the case instead, though, is that a lot of corporations make a commitment to supplier diversity. And so that's where those certifications can come into play. And earlier, I saw a, several questions about minority-owned certifications. And so Nadine started to talk a little bit about what that looks like on the federal side. But I'd love to just toss in there that the WeBank certification that we offer that focuses on women in the private sector, we have a sibling organization called the Greater New England Supplier Diversity, Greater New England Minority Supplier Diversity Council, excuse me. There's no formal affiliation with us at CWE, but we do have a partnership and we cross refer folks. But the GNEM SDC is a really great resource for folks who are looking to bid on private sector contracts with a minority owned certification. <clears throat> so I'll back into the woman owned certification that we offer. And as I started to say, there are two sides to that certification. There are corporations that have made a commitment to do a certain percentage of their business, in this case with women-run firms, and there are women-run firms that want to do business with those corporations. So we certify both of them. Now that certification does come at a cost and it's pegged to your, uh, to your business revenues. More than happy to share those fee schedules with folks as they get there. But it's a really great option to become acclimated to the world of certifications, especially as it comes to the private sector. Our WeBank team actually holds free monthly webinars that you can find on our website and or you can just shoot me an email and I'll be glad to send you the link. It does a nice introduction to all of the different women-owned certifications and it chats a little bit about what you get for getting certified through WeBank. WeBank, by the way, is not the only game in town. If you want to get certified as women owned to do business in the private sector, it doesn't mean that you have to use the WeBank certification. It's just the largest one uh, nationwide. It's the largest third party certifier of women owned businesses. And the reason why that third party bit, that fee bit that's so important is because a lot of times corporations don't they, they, they tend to recognize the third party certifications which is why we offer it for both of them. It does come with a cost, but you get invitation to free networking events, matchmaker events, much like what the SBA puts on for the public sector side. There are matchmaking events where you can connect with corporations that are looking to buy whatever it is that you're selling. Some pretty cool stuff there. It is a national certification, much like the Woesby certification that Nadine started to chat about which means that if you get certified with WeBank, it's headquartered in our Boston office, it's gonna cover all of the United States. That certification will be recognized with corporations nationwide. I'll throw out there a couple of uh, just clarification points about certification in general, which I think might be helpful for this audience, which is that certification is not required in order to bid on a contract. What it does is it can give you a leg up. It's not a guarantee of business but it can be really helpful as in, in that arena. So I just wanna let you all know that um, to be eligible for the Women Business Enterprise National Council certification, you must be at least 51% owned, operated and controlled by a woman. 
And there are lots of documents that pertain to that and I'll stick it in the chat, but you can go to, well, I'll stick it in the chat once I finish talking, <laughs> little, little trouble with the multitasking there. But there are documents that you would want to submit, a lot of which are very similar to what you would need to submit on the federal side. Last bit that I'd like to share with you about WeBank certification is that in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we have a cooperative agreement with the Office of Supplier Diversity headquartered in Boston that does contracting on the state level. So the cooperative agreement between our WeBank certification arm and the Office of Supplier Diversity indicates that if you pay your fee, you go through the whole woman-owned certification process with our WeBank team, you can effectively sign an extra piece of paper and become certified through the Office of Supplier Diversity as well, so that you can have the similar privilege and preference when bidding on state level contracts. Thank you. Hi, Grace. Are you ready? Hi. Oh, are you? Just go ahead, do your thing. And when, I'm, when you want me to come in, I'll come in. Okay, Michelle, we can turn it over to Grace now. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Grace Otter, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak at uh, Western Massachusetts Women in Business Virtual Conference. Again, my name is Grace, and uh, I am the procurement specialist for the Massachusetts Procurement Technical Assistance Center. I've been with uh, PTAC for 15 years. I provide technical assistance and advice small businesses or small business owners on how to do business with the federal government, uh, state, local government. I conduct government contracting workshops. Uh, because of COVID-19, we do it virtually uh, online and uh, on the phone. You can reach us anywhere. We'll call you back. We'll talk anyhow you want it, except for meeting in person for now. So let's get started. Um, I know Nadine and uh, Michelle had already gone through most of the stuff that I was going to talk about because procurement is procurement. It's a government uh, set of rules and regulations as to how you do business with the federal government. So it's all the same things that they were discussing with you. So I may skip some of it and just mention it briefly. And if you need to get in touch with me or any of our P PTAC counselors located throughout the region, we can direct you to the appropriate people. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about the PTAC program because a lot of people, when we say PTAC, uh, they may not understand or know or have not uh, come in contact with us, but we've been around for a long time. The program was created by Congress in 1985 to help businesses compete in government marketplace. We're funded through cooperative agreement between DOD, the state of Massachusetts, and local entities such as the University of Massachusetts. PTAC, Massachusetts PTAC was created in November 1999. We have about 100 PTAC programs nationwide. Many PTACs are affiliated with the Small Business Development Centers. So when you see SBDC or MSBDC and they mention PTAC is because we're probably the third arm of the PTACs, of the, the MSBDCs. Um, we are a resource and we do mainly government procurement, which is uh, government contracting. We are located nationwide. Our mission solely is to help you sell to the federal, the state, the state and the local government. So like Nadine said before, uh, she mentioned the 500, over $500 billion that is uh, given to uh, businesses. Uh, the money, that's the money that they spend on good, goods and services alone. And the state of Massachusetts has their own uh, information. If you go to usaspending.gov, you would see the federal side of things, which is how much money is allocated to different industries. The state of Massachusetts has about $30 billion plus dollars, including municipal governments that they spend on goods and services. So that's why PTAC is here to help you navigate through all of this through government contracting. Now, the first thing you need to do, and I'm just going to skim through that because it has already been mentioned a couple of times by um, Michelle and Nadine, you have to be registered. In order to work with the federal government, you have to be, have your registrations. 
You cannot do any business with the federal government without registering. And the first thing you're gonna need will be your DUNS number, which stands for Data Universal Numbering System. It's done by Dun and Bar Street, and it will be changing though. You will be given a unique entity ident uh, ID later, but that's something that's coming down the road. You will need your tax ID, um, you will need your taxpayer's name, your business information, and all of that, and also your EFT inf information to register for SAM registration. She mentioned SAM registration already, so I'm just going to just mention br briefly that that is what PTAC would help you with, all of the registrations that you need. Uh, one thing I just wanted to say is that um, SAM registration is uh, annually, so you have to update your record e every year. Uh, you have to maintain that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to add to it is that um, she did mention, uh, or both ladies mentioned the set of sites. Um, the government allots 77% of goods and services, the money for goods and services for large businesses. 23% of prime contracts for small businesses is divvied up between women owned small businesses. They get 5% of the contracts. And these are just goals. 5% of prime and subcontracts are given to small disadvantaged businesses and then the hub zones. So when you come to PTAC, we'll be able to help you with all of that um, uh, information. We are a resource, again, we don't do, and then we do um, proposals. We help you with review your proposals. We don't do the proposal for you. If you're looking to bid on a contract, we'll look through it, we'll make an appointment. Also, in order to work with PTAC, you have to be at least two years in business. However, we do help uh, small business companies that come in as new businesses. We will be able to send you to our colleagues at the MSBDC. They'll help you with small business plans and everything that you need as a startup. You stay with us and we'll give you all that information. However, in two years, you will be able to um, have that experience to be able to get into all the certification. They did mention certifications such as the uh, small uh, women-owned small business certification, so I'm gonna skip that. The only thing I'll add, add to that is that you have to be certified by the SBA before it was self-certification, and that was mentioned before. But again, like Michelle said, you have the option to use a third party certifier, there are certain organizations that will certify that for you for a fee. And um, I would like to add that the state side also has their certification. And that's part of our uh, PTAC um, services that we offer. When you come to us, if you're lost as to how to get this certification, for example, the state of Massachusetts has their MBE, which is Minority Business Enterprise, Women Business and Enterprise, VBE for the vet veterans. And I would like to spend a couple of times on the veteran verification. Veteran verification is something that we help small businesses with. I am a certified uh, counselor for the uh, VA. They've trained me to help uh, veterans. So I think that's the most important things that I would like to mention, and my time is up. So just reach out to PTAC by going to massptac.org and you fill out a form request for counseling, and we would just send your request to any of the counselors located in the region. If you are out of state, they have their own PTACs as well. So we can direct you to that. And uh, I think my time is up. Grace, thank you so very much. So PTAC is for Procurement Technical Assistance Center. Someone asked in the chat, what are the acronyms? And I did put in um, the chat WeBank's acronym, as well as um, WOSB, when you heard Michelle mentioning WOSB. Uh, we put that in there also, the woman-owned small business. 
yeah. as well as the Women Business Enterprise National Council. So I don't think there were any other acronyms that I heard being used. So we were trying to be sensitive to that. Yeah. I saw that Somali also said, um, please do not pay for DUNS or tax or employee ID Everything number. Yes. Thank you. That was something that I said also. Registration is free. We want to be careful when we say everything is free, but <laughs> all of your registrations at the municipal, at the state, or the federal levels, they are free for starting to do business with the government. It's One last thing I wanted to add real quick. PTAC does this thing called the bid match. And it matches your, uh, the type of service that you have with uh, contracting opportunities out there. It's a program that we, we give to our, anyone that registers with us for free. We also have um, training that we do through Govology, what we call Govology. There are classes and courses that you could take e online. And um, I think I just wanted to pass that information to you that if you register with us, you get that for free. Thank you, Grace. Thank you so very much. Michelle? Hello. Hi. Hi there. Is there um, a little bit more that you want to add about who We Bank is? And I heard you talk specifically about doing business privately here from the government. I normally say federal government contracting and then, you know, doing commercial contracting. That's normally the language. You want to talk more about that, uh, Michelle? Sure. Yeah. So, so there are these couple of buckets, right, that certifications fall into, and, and it does feel a lot like alphabet soup, like what we were just starting to talk about with the acronyms. So we've been leaving a lot of them out. But um, when it comes to the private sector side, anything that's not run on the the through the SBA, through the state or local assistance. Um, oh, thank you, Samal. Sorry, I'm sitting here talking to the screen like you all can see me, but you can. <laughs> Um, that said, so WeBank plays in the private sector. So that means that we have certificates, corporations that have made a, a commitment independent of federally required set-asides that, that pertain to certifications on the public sector. Corporations make a commitment to do a certain percentage of their business with women-run firms every year. MGM Springfield became a member when they came to when they came to Western Mass, Bank of America, Citizens Bank, we have several corporations that you can find on our website that have become corporate members. Those guys are looking to do business with certified women-run firms. And so what we do with that is we certify corporations that want to do business with women-run firms, and then we certify women-owned businesses that want to compete on bids in the private sector. Uh, not sure if Madeline is still on, but Madeline is a great example who was on the panel earlier. Madeline's a great example of someone who's become certified on both the federal and the uh, WeBank side to bid on contracts in both of those areas. But there are lots of options. So I think that the nutshell answer to your question, Nadine, a lot of times when people reach out to us and they say, gosh, there are all these different ways to get certified as well-known. Which one do I go for? My first question is always, who are you trying to do business with? If it is something on the public sector side, Nadine and Grace are wonderful, wonderful friends to have. Can chat with you on that. If you're looking to do business on the corporate side, if you want to sell something to Bank of America or whatever it may be, WeBank is probably the certification for you or its equivalent, the Greater New England Minority Supplier Diversity Council for non-women-owned certifications. And if you have no idea, <laughs> chat with us. <laughs> we're, we're more than happy to, to talk with you about that. We offer that free monthly webinar. The PTAC is incredibly knowledgeable in this area. We're more than happy to, to chat with you about what may or may not um, benefit from a certification without thank actually you, making that decision for you. <laughs> Michelle, thank you. And the Center for Women in Enterprise is the woman on small business best friend. Now, I like to say that smart men will also go to the Women Business Center or Center for Women in Enterprise. So um, that is important to know that they are open to everyone, not only women. 
And as Grace talked about some of the targets, and you heard me mention them, the 23% for all small business, 5% for women, 3% for HUD zone, 3% for service disabled veteran owned, and 5% for the small disadvantaged business, 8 um, slash 8A. And for the woman owned small business in 2019, out of the 490 something billion dollars that was spent, 26 billion was spent with the woman owned small business. So it was about 5.19%. And that was on that government wide procurement scorecard, which has been loaded here in the chat. As yeah, the, okay, I, like, I would like to start my business, but I don't know how to start. That's a great <laughs> question. Not, not a contracting question, but it's still a great question. Yeah. So you've already met um, many fabulous organizations here, the CWE score msbdc so as arrested said earlier just connect with one of us we have uh, our emails in the in the in the conference program and we'll be happy to help you that's where to start that's it very simple and the next one is about whether or not there's a free certification for women-owned small business and that's one that that i we can probably both handle grace there are these two different types of women-owned certifications right there's the one on the the private Federal. sector side and there's one on the public sector side Mm -hmm. Public sector side is what Nadine was starting to talk about before, but I'll turn to you, Grace, on that one. On the private sector side, it is not free. The um, women-owned certification, uh, when you come to PTAC, we walk you through um, the certification, how, what you need. There are certain preparation checklists that you have to go through because there are eligibility, eligibility requirements. You have to, for instance, as uh, Michelle mentioned earlier on, you have to be 51% owned and controlled um, business by yourself. So when you're 50-50, um, that may not cut it. So there are certain checklists that we walk you through uh, with women-owned certification. On the state side, they have the women business enterprise that was already mentioned. And also, I'm um, forgetting to mention the minority uh, business enterprise as well. So if you're a mi minority there are and you're a woman, you can also apply or for that certification, which is uh, the women business enterprise, as well as minority-owned uh, business enterprise. We have the state side for the veteran business enterprise as well. And again, we have another one that for the Portuguese. So that doesn't get a lot of mention, but I would like to mention that the state of Massachusetts uh, does have Portuguese business enterprise certification um, that they, I, I think what it is, is they uh, refer you to a different resource so they can assist you with that certification. Um, I don't get a lot of that, but if you come to me, I will be able to assist you any way I can to get you started. Great. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Grace. I got kicked out of Zoom, guys. It looked like we are out of time. We did post some links, and I attempted to post the request for counseling with the PTAC, so you can be back in touch with the PTAC counselor for your area. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thanks, Nadine. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Grace. Great job. Now, so last on the agenda, but certainly not least, is Diane Darling. She's in a, a new addition to our SBA team, and she has so many talents. And so she's going to uh, cover a particular topic that should be of great interest to everyone here. And it is how to market your business during uncertain times. And we are in the, about the most uncertain uh, time <laughs> that uh, I think in our lifetimes that we've, any of us have experienced. So uh, without further ado, turn it over to Diane. The floor is yours or the video. Thank <laughs> you the so video. much. The, these are uncertain times. And for those of us older than 29, We've been through several of these. We've been through, uh, I went through September 11th. I went through the crash of 87, certainly 2008. These are definitely uncertain times. Um, I have a small business. I have it on kind of somewhat hold at the moment because I have joined the SBA and it's delightful to be uh, working with all of you and knowing what it's like for small businesses to try and succeed at this time. So I have a quick 
15 to 20 minutes to give you some ideas and ways for you to market your business in these uncertain times. So the first thing I'm going to invite you to do is I'm going to do sort of three things, contacts, conversations, and converting them into clients. So the first thing we're going to talk about is your contacts. You want to start building up a really good list of your contacts. And that could be your customers who come into your shop or used to come into your shop. It could be the people you meet online at events like this. Some of you have been putting your LinkedIn uh, connect, uh, uh, URLs in the chat. But this is really important for you to build out a database of, of all the different people you know. And then you also want to begin to organize that database. I'm going to end with some systems and I'll give you some actually specific systems that may be useful for you um, and some websites and things like that. But for right now, I am really encouraging you to begin to come up with a really good list of contacts. Um, someone actually right before uh, our session today called me up and said, Diane, would you believe it? I've been in business 20 years and I don't have an email system. And I'm like, how can you not have an email system? We're going to get you all sorted out. So I helped him understand one, some different things that he needed to do to get that into systems. So you want to build out your list. I would definitely encourage you to power up on your LinkedIn. This is an incredible time for you to go into your LinkedIn, be sure your profile is in really good top shape, and do some power inviting. You want to have at least 500 people on your LinkedIn. That puts you into a different level of visibility. Maybe you're going to want to post on LinkedIn. Maybe you're going to want to write some articles on LinkedIn, but begin to really have a good presence. If you type your name into Google, it's more likely your LinkedIn profile is going to show up than anything else. That is because LinkedIn spends a whole lot more money on search engine optimization. All of you are welcome to invite me on LinkedIn. If you will say something about today, that would be great because I do get some really weird invitations. I'm not gonna lie about that. But go ahead and really begin to build out your contacts. Start small and create some engagement. So you wanna be sure you're not just data collecting, but you're saying thank you. Let's schedule a call. Let's be in touch. I'd like to better understand what your needs are because I want to be really sure I can be helpful for you. And it's not just your business. So for example, I'm from rural Indiana, among other places. I've also lived in Asia, lived in Washington, DC. I lived in Montgomery, Alabama, but rural Indiana is where I spent a chunk of my life. So I actually host in, um, gatherings, not that often, for ex-Midwesterners of Boston. So find different ways for you to reach out and spread out so people understand better who you are and what your contacts are and begin to build that out. So it's not just one. I jokingly say I am 0 for 3. I am single, I don't have a dog, and I do not have children. So when I go networking, it is just me. Whereas in many situations, people know each other from their kids or they know each other from their dog or they know each other from their husband. I don't have that. So you want to think about what are the ways that you can spread out and build out different networks. It's not going to be just your business, but that's going to be one. So you got your contacts. Now we want to switch this into conversations. So some conversations are going to be one-on-one. -on -one. And you want to certainly make time for that. But then you're also going to have other conversations that are going to be one-to-many, which is like an email newsletter. So you want to begin to think about what is the various different ways that you can help people. Do you make great chocolate chip? cookies. Do you, the other day I happened to see when in the middle of the COVID that Ikea actually published their recipe for their meatballs. Guess what? Ikea sells more meatballs than they do furniture. Think about that. So they published their recipe. Are people going to never go into Ikea and buy meatballs? No, they're going to go do it, but it was a great way for Ikea to get contacts and information and turn that into a conversation, which was one to many. So you want to begin to build out your list. Who are your fans? Who are your suppliers? Who are your competitors? Who are your collaborators? Begin to think about this ecosystem because all of those people can be your champions. There's a woman that I actually give some business to. Are we competitors? Yes, but right now while I'm working for the SBA, I can't always do things. 
So I refer a lot of my work over to her. And I'm really grateful to know about her because I know she'll do a really, really good job. Now, one of the reasons why we hesitate to have these conversations is something called imposter syndrome. This is more of an issue for women than it is for men. It's an issue for both. I spoke about imposter syndrome at a Harvard panel in January pre-COVID. I was on a panel. I suffered from our imposter syndrome because here I am at Harvard Business School and I didn't go to Harvard Business School. But I thought, you know what? It's a real thing I feel. And I talked about what it was like to be in that room and they, there was not a single seat. I mean, there were people all but sitting on each other's shoulders. This is an issue that talks in our head. It's called head trash that says, oh, you shouldn't make that call. You shouldn't do that. You're not good enough. And that's something that is a negative chatter that we want to say, just be quiet. I just acknowledge it. I say, okay, yeah, you're the one that's telling me not to do it. And you're the one that is telling me to do it. And I just have a conversation with those two people sitting on my shoulders, accepting the fact that yes, this is a challenging situation. So one thing I'm gonna encourage you to do is to have some conversations. And here's an exercise, and you may wanna to go to a different town than the one you live in. So the next time you're at the grocery store, I'm going to encourage you to start a conversation with somebody in line when you're waiting to pay. You now have the six feet apart, so you, know, you wanna respect that. And you can maybe just say, you know what? That looks kind of interesting. Do you, you know, have you tried that food before? And then be quiet and let them talk. Now, one of the things for those of us who live in New England, I know we saw some people from San Diego and Houston and New Englanders, we're not necessarily known for our friendliness. So you have low expectations that you're gonna chat with somebody. You've got a mask on, so it's even more protective. But you know what? Test this out. This is like learning to drive a stick shift on a beat up old car. Just test it out and practice your comfort level and grow with your confidence to talk to people and have some things that you can do to begin to have that courage to start conversations. Conversations are so incredibly important. You can find out what people are needing in your business. You can find out what some of the challenges are, not maybe necessarily at the grocery store, but this gives you some practice on that muscle to get a little bit more comfortable. The other exercise I'm going to encourage you to do is to do something with, I usually use SurveyMonkey to do my surveys. You can use Google, you can use Typeform. There's all kinds of tools that you can use. But I'm going to encourage you to find maybe 20 to 50 people and ask them to send you two to five words about you and two to three sentences about you and or your business. And those are some sentences and words that you can use when you go market. Because right now, in some cases, we are shut down. I've been in these four walls for almost six months and I live in 600 square feet. It's pretty small and it gets a little crazy because I start talking to myself and that makes me crazy. So what I'm gonna tell you to do is to reach out to other people and ask them to do this. When I did this, people said, Diane, you're a pioneer in networking. I would have never used that phrase, never used that phrase. Diane, you're more courageous than I would be to do some of the things that you do. So you're gonna hear some different things. I heard about tenacity, I heard about authenticity. It was wonderful for me to have these words and things that I could use when I was trying to talk to people about a little bit about what I could do to help other people. So next we're gonna talk about clients and customers. Yay, yippee, you've got a client or you've got a customer. But now you wanna understand more about them because you want them to give your, word to, your, your information to other people. So you wanna think about what are some ways that you can encourage other people to let them know how they can help you. People would like to help you they're willing to do it. You have to be willing to ask them to do it. So a couple of things you wanna think about is, it's called the art of the ask, is what are some different things you can ask of them? Can you ask them to share your information with three or five people? Can you ask them for feedback? You know, would, would you like to have, um, you know, uh, this jacket in purple versus red? You know, what are some different things that you can do to be sure that other people are going to be really, really a very compelling champion for you and get to understand what their problems are. 
Mark Cuban has said numbers of times on Shark Tank. If you want to make a million dollars, sell a million, fix a million dollar problem, or fix a million, or fix a one dollar problem for a million people. So you want to think about what is the problem that you can solve, and how is that going to work for other people. Last, what I want to do is talk about some systems or tools to help you with your marketing. As I mentioned earlier, my friend called me literally at 12:30, saying, "You know, Diane, I don't have an email list. It's called an ESP, email service provider." And so you want to be sure you do invest in some of these systems. I have no financial connection to any of these. I'm going to give you a couple ones to think about. There's Mailchimp or Constant Contact, which are two of the more well-known ones for small businesses, and they are silo. They're only one purpose, which is email marketing for the most part. You want to do something like that. There's another one I use. I recommend sometimes for email marketing called Zoho, Z-O-H-O, and Zoho is a suite. It has your CRM, it has your email marketing, it actually has financial stuff, it has chat for your website. You could probably run General Motors on this thing.、Um, it's a little bit more complex, but if you're looking to do a deeper dive, but you do want to have a system because you want to be transparent. And、this is going to be more important as we go into a, at some point. The United States is going to have something similar to what Europe does now, which is this、um, email uh, email uh, compliance. So you want to be sure you're getting ready to be prepared for some of these changes that are going to be taking place. You definitely want to see have a CRM system. What does a CRM stand for? Customer Relationship Management. It's a fancy word for a database. So what you want to do is you want to think about how can you find what is someone's contact information, and so you know what's their phone number, what's their email, and some of these tools, Zoho is one of them, and Close C L O Z E C L O Z E it was actually started here in Massachusetts is another one that I often recommend for small businesses, and so you can go in there and it keeps track of the conversations that you have with people, so you have some history of what that communication is about. And last but not least is LinkedIn. You definitely want to be in LinkedIn. Invest in that time and be sure that you are highly visible because people want to be sure to give you business, but they can't give you business if they can't find you. So that's my fast、uh, some top tips and ways to market your business in a in difficult times. I hope that's been helpful, and I look forward to hearing any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you, Arreste, Somalia, and everybody on this team for putting this all together today. Thank you, Diane. So, are there any questions for Diane? We have a、uh, we have、uh, several minutes for Q and A. One thing I'll also just share is this never gets done. Marketing is never done, so it's it's not like you know, it's like laundry. There's always one more thing. So, be kind to yourself. Be really kind to yourself because there will always be one more thing to do. But I'm happy to answer any questions or things like that. The last resource was the Zoho, Z O H L, and I'll go ahead and put the links in. Um. And see. Um. Da 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 da. Oh, we have seven minutes. I thought I was done at three twenty. My apologies. <laughs> Maybe I talked too quickly. Um, do I separate no, marketing and sales as different processes? Excellent question. So here's you want to think about this as a funnel. Marketing is the big, big bucket at the top, and then the middle is networking. So marketing is the SBA. In the middle is, let's say, Bob Nelson, who I met many years ago、um, at the Boston Business Journal, and then you go to sales or you know、uh, or, or clients. And that's where you actually have the transaction. So you have this funnel of how all of that flows.、Um, Diane, are you able to ask everyone to share their LinkedIn?、Um, sure, I will put my LinkedIn there. I would encourage all of the rest of you to. One thing you absolutely do not want to do is you do not want to take the names from LinkedIn and automatically add them. To your your uh, uh, constant contact or Mailchimp or something like that. That's a, a violation, and you will end up in LinkedIn jail. And I have <laughs> tried to help people get out of LinkedIn jail,、mm-hmm. and sometimes it's easier than others. But、um, I would also share with you speaking, volunteering,、um, being on Zooms,、um, 
think about different creative ways for you to be in, in, uh, in a more visible situation so people can actually know who you are and, and have that kind of contact with you. Um, any other questions here? I'm seeing some people are putting in their uh, LinkedIn uh, URLs. So a couple different things with your LinkedIn URLs. You want to customize your LinkedIn URL. So I will put mine in here and it is linkedin.com slash in slash Diane Darling. If your LinkedIn has a bunch of numbers, you have not customized your LinkedIn URL. I will also encourage you to put your LinkedIn URL in your signature. So all my e email signatures um, have my LinkedIn there so people can immediately find something about me. And in your LinkedIn profile, you wanna talk a little bit about the problem that you solve. Um, you don't wanna necessarily have it be, Diane is this and Diane is that and Diane is this. No, you wanna have, I like to help small businesses solve problems. So those are some great ways for you to, thinking about ways for you to market yourself. Anybody have any questions? Diane, um, I do have a question on behalf of some of the small businesses that I've worked with is um, people are finding it really hard, some women that I've worked with, uh, to promote and market their business right now because they feel bad. They feel like they're asking for money when they're promoting their business, you know, and I try to explain to them, you have, you're solving a problem. You have something to offer. Why not just check in with those folks and then just let them know that you are here to help them anything that they need, including you know, your services. So how would you approach that as well? So I, 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 I'm very sensitive to that because I think people are going through tough times right now. I think it's important to be sensitive. It's also important to say, you know, if you need my services, pick me. You know, I, I need to buy groceries. I can pick Market Basket, I can pick Whole Foods, I can pick, you know, so I, I am going to be spending money. I am going to be spending money at this time. Um, but you want to be sensitive about it and you want to be thoughtful about your pricing. You want to be pro, you know, professional and appropriate. <clears throat> but I think that it's important for us to be sure that we know that we are solving a problem. Um, you know, and I think there's interesting businesses that are coming out of this pandemic. You know, imagine if we had all bought Zoom stock in January. We could retire by now, um, but, you know, but, you know, Zoom, I've been a Zoom user for many, many years, many years. And I, you know, I, I'm the former president of the American Society for Training and Development in Boston. It's now called the Association of Talent Development. We were using Zoom, I think, four or five years ago. Um, we would, in fact, I remember the first time we had a Zoom keynote. Um, because the guy didn't want to travel. So that was something we were willing to, you know, do. Um, and then we realized, you know, about 10 minutes into his talk, nobody was recording it. And we were like, oh my gosh, how could we have, you know, missed that opportunity? So I, I think, you know, there are businesses that are going to succeed. Um, you know, certainly whoever comes up with the first vaccine is going to be, you know, a multi-billionaire when this happens. But, you know, it doesn't mean that you're taking away money from somebody else. So, you know, if you're, you know, I think if you're sabotaging somebody else's business, you know, that's a different story. I, I have angst at times with Amazon because I, I, I would rather go to a little small local business or a bookstore and buy the book because I know that will keep somebody in business if I possibly can. Then there's other times in the middle of a blizzard, I'm not going out, you know, so I think you want to be sensitive about it, but if you're appropriate about it, um, and there are a lot of people who are inappropriate. There are a lot of people who are inappropriate, and that's what gives marketing a bad rap. And right. so you have to be thoughtful about that. And one suggestion I give to folks as well is when you're out there networking, right, find those chambers of commerce who are very involved, who are networking with other uh, who are bringing people together. Um, here in Western Mass, we also have this organization called Living Local 413. And they, all they do is promote our local businesses. And one thing to remember too is that you're not just promoting to the community or the clients. Those folks that are part of those organizations are also your potential customers, their potential uh, 
uh, business relationships right there. So um, to, just to keep that in mind. Yep. And there was a question in here about, you know, one of my thoughts on social media marketing. I think social media is terrific. However, it is not as useful or impactful as your own email list. You don't own Facebook. You don't own Instagram. Instagram, Instagram is actually now owned by Facebook. You don't own LinkedIn. You do own your relationship with people if you have an email. And if you treat, that, if you pe treat those people well, and you send them information that is useful to them and you don't just bash them to buy, buy, buy. You wanna be helpful, helpful, then make an ask. Helpful information, helpful information, then make an ask. So the more helpful information you can provide, the more people will remember you um, from doing some good information. Social, I do a lot of social media. I've hired somebody to help out with that just to keep my name, um, you know, relative during this time, but you want to be, again, very respectful of how often you hit up people with an ask. Thank you, Diane. Appreciate it. So uh, yes, thank you so much. And there were several questions, actually, that came in that require uh, more time than we have. But basically, what I want to remind folks, and I'm going to shoot it out there, if you go on sba.gov slash updates and put in your zip code, you will be connected with the local SBA office here in Massachusetts, set of Boston, and uh, almost all of our resource partners will list um, the different types of uh, conferences and trainings that are available. I know the Small Business Development Center, SCORE, CWE have all done something on social media marketing. Uh, or if you have marketing questions in general about mar uh, marketing consultant, you can work with our resource partners. Uh, you can work with Diane. So, you, so these are free as opposed to uh, fee for service. So again, keep in mind to work with our resource partner network, get on, our updates uh, and then also with what you today our resource partners get on their newsletters so you'll know what's happening you will uh, see the the different uh, uh, courses basically that are available even Diane's done a course where or a, a webinar where she uh, uh, was all about LinkedIn. It was all the tips and tricks on, on LinkedIn. So I don't know if, Diane, you're scheduled to do that again in the, in the near future. But again, get on our updates, get on our newsletter, and you'll see that there's so much that's out there that you continue to learn and, and, and grow your business. So, uh, uh, so our poll, let's see, before the conference, which organizations did you already know about? SBA, SCORE. So you can see the, the, the branding, the marketing was pretty good with SBA and SCORE. And then uh, uh, people didn't know as much about our other resource partners. So great. So now you know about our resource partners, which is awesome. And uh, anyway, so Samalad now is going to take us into some networking. I'm not sure how this is going to work. Yeah. <laughs> We've never, I've never been part of that. So I, she's going to randomly assign folks to rooms mm -hmm. and we'll see how this all works. Everyone's done a wonderful job so far actually of marketing uh, on the, in the chat box. I see a lot of different things happen in the chat box. So you've already done a really wonderful job there. Uh, so I do want to uh, explain once, once, once we go into the breakout rooms, <laughs> Uh, we're going to be there for about 25 minutes or so, and we want to encourage you to introduce yourselves to each other and network. Uh, for those who are co-hosts, um, you can pop in and out of different breakout rooms as needed. We're going to have about uh, three to four participants per room, and when we're close to the end of the networking time, I'm going to give you a, a two-minute warning, and you'll be coming back here, but at that time, you can log out. And, uh, and I see a lot of people are, are signing off now. But anyway, for those of you who do have to go, thanks again to everyone who participated. I think it was a great event for everyone. And thank you to our entire team. So, all right, Samalin, rock Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Let's see how this works. <laughs> Should be fun.